Hello, everyone joining us. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Karen Schroeder. I'm a postdoc at Columbia Zuckerman Institute and one of the organizers of a Neuro Launchpad trainee talk series. Uh, welcome to the second ever Neuro Launchpad talk session. A platform that's by and for trainees to share and discuss their science. So this season we have a slate of 10 sessions scheduled through January, uh, which you can check out on our website, neurolaunchpad.com, or on our Twitter. And uh, so far we're having a lot of fun, so we hope to continue this event uh, into future seasons. So today our theme is uh, cellular and molecular mechanisms in development and repair. And we have two great talks coming up. If you have any questions for the speakers, please submit them in the ask a question box and we'll have time for Q&A after each talk. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our moderator, uh, Professor Alex Jaworski, who's gonna take it from here. He's an assistant professor of brain science at Brown. And we also have a wonderful co-moderator, Lena Ali, who is a postdoc uh, at Harvard in the lab of Gord Official. So she'll be handling questions from the audience. And uh, Alex, oh, we seem to have lost Alex's video. Oh. So people cannot see me? My camera seems we to be on. We can see you. Okay, mm -hmm. and my, uh, my sound is okay too? Uh, your sound is okay. All right. Um, oh, so, there, yeah. everything's okay. So thank you, Karen. Uh, I think it's uh, really great to be a uh, part of this uh, as a moderator. It's a uh, great idea to have this type of forum. Um, so without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Yasu Ito. Uh, Yasu is uh, currently a postdoc uh, at Harvard in Jeffrey Macklis's lab, and uh, where he's studying corticospinal connectivity. He uh, earned his Bachelor in Engineering from the University of Tokyo. He also completed a PhD uh, at the University of Tokyo, working with Yukiko Goto on uh, neuronal fate commitment and migration in the mouse neocortex. Um, and so today he's going to tell us about his work uh, in Jeffrey Macklis's lab. He's been there for six years and I'm very excited to hear about his work. Thank you for the kind introduction, Alex. And let me share my screen. Um, Something seems to have gone a bit wrong there. <laughs> Let's get him back. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was trying to share my screen and somehow I got deleted. No worries. Um, do you see my screen or do you see me talking? Right now I see you. Oh, okay. great. Now I see your screen. Hey, uh, is it working fine? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Alex, for the kind introduction, and I would like to thank the organizers for this great opportunity. And today, I'm going to tell you about two stories about descending axon projection coming from the cortex down to the brainstem and spinal cord, as you can see in English. Using the first 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you about the identification of the proteoglycan lumicon for the first time in axon development. And I'm further going to tell you that Lumicon regulates the specificity of branching of two populations of corticospinal neurons in a non cell autonomous manner. Then I will touch upon Lumicon's interesting relevance to, new, to the neurodegenerative disease ALS and the evolution of corticospinal circuit. Using the last five minutes, I'm going to briefly tell you about some new approaches our lab reported last year to look in depth and quantitatively 
at the subcellular molecular machinery in growth cones of subtype specific neurons in vivo. And then I'm going to tell you briefly about my application of the approaches to subcerebral projection neurons with special attention to the functions of the key central transcriptional regulator CTIB2 in the cerebral cortex. Start with the first part, which is equally contributed by our former postdoc, Vibusani. Our brain has immense capacity for perception, cognition, and internal thoughts, but its ultimate output to interact with the external environment is motor movement. A mammalian brain has a population of cortical projection neurons that send direct a projection to the brainstem and spinal cord, and they enable voluntary and skilled movements such as speech and precise finger movements. Cortical spinal neurons are somatotopically organized in humans. We all know that they are laid out from legs medially to arms face laterally. And same is true in rodents, where rostrolateral cortical spinals are bulbous cervical projecting and called medial cortical spinals are thought to be thoracolumbar projecting. So I tell you something different uh, we have discovered later in my talk, but I'm going to call them CSS and medial for now. And the question we have been trying to address is how this segmentally specific axon targeting is achieved during development. Though this is the general layout in textbooks, we first wanted to look at this mototopy with more precision so that we could isolate bulbar cervical and thoracolumbar projecting cortical spinals. To make long story short, we use both retrograde and anterograde labelings. In the retrograde labeling, you see a defined thoracolumbar area in yellow and a larger bulbar cervical area in green, while in the AV anterograde labeling, you see green axons from rosolateral sensory motor cortex mostly, uh, 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 terminate mostly in the cervical segment, and the red axons from cord medial extend all the way down to the lumbar cord. So we have validated that this is the spatial localization, so and then we isolated cortex from each area. We focus on the first postnatal week when cortical spinals are entering spinal cord, stopping or keep going, and then actively collateralizing. We have identified a number of differentially expressed genes, but here are two exemplars, a cage like 14 and cream 1. So bulbar cervical specific cage like 14 is expressed also laterally, and for columbus specific cream 1 is expressed called medially. And essentially, they are non overlapping populations. Although I don't have time to tell you the experiments, we have found in this work that Kerch and Krim regulate axon extension down to specific spinal segments. And in the rest of my, uh, the first part of my talk, I'm going to tell you that Lumican is expressed by bulbous cervical cortical spinals and how Lumican controls axon collateralization in the cervical spinal cord at first in a simple scheme like this one. So we got interested in Lumicon because of its expression, expression profile, showing bulbar specific expression, and it goes up over time. First, we tested Lumicon expression in vivo, and we found that it's very specifically expressed uh, in uh, rosolateral layer, in rosolateral layer five, both at the RNA and protein levels. So Lumicon is not expressed immediately, corresponding to the, the microarray result. And for the official nozzles in the audience, Lumicon is expressed only by subcerebral projection neurons in layer 5, but not by colossal neurons. Its expression uh, peaks around P10, and it goes down by P14. It's also expressed in meninges, and all the semi signals go away in Lumicon knockout. Then what do we know about Lumicon? So Lumican is an ECM protein. It can exist as a transulfate proteoglycan or KSPG. Then proteoglycans in general restrict axon outgrowth. Except a recent study published by Virant Hutton's group, the role of Lumican in CNS development remains unexplored. So we wanted to know like, what this molecule is doing. And as I said, Protoglycans are normally secreted and inhibit axon growth. So we thought that Lumican, as we thought Lumican is likely not a cell autonomous axon growth regulator. 
but it raised an interesting hypothesis of a secreted molecule that keeps other populations out. And I'm going to tell you that's how it works. But that said, of course, as a baseline, we wanted to test, we wanted to ask if there were massive effects of the Lunica knockout on early cortical spinal development. And I'm not showing you the primary results here, but we did a series of experiments in that then we can look at and show normal specification, normal subtype development, normal axon entry into the spinal cord, and normal axon extension within the spinal cord. So now the baseline is set. So then to test the hypothesis that Lumicon is keeping our population out, we injected a trace of dye BDA into cold medial cortical spinals that do not express Lumicon, and then trace axon branching in the cervical cord. So here you see the BDA injection site in the cortex, and here there is a dramatic difference in the total amount of cervical axon quaternals in the mechanical knockout. So with careful normalization to the number of CST axons in the cord, so there is a substantial and significant increase in the collateral density in the mechanical knockout, indicating that lumicon is non-serotonously suppressing axon quaternization in panel. We tested the effect of lumicon overexpression. So in this experiment, we injected AV rosso laterally to overexpressed lumicon and then injected BDA called medially. We verified that there's no overlap between these two injections. As you can see in these images, so lumicon overexpression caused drastic reduction of axon collaterals in the cervical cord and the quantification demonstrates very efficient suppression of axon collaterals by lumical overexpression. To summarize the results so far, we found that lumican is expressed by uh, bulbous cervical cortex panels, and lumican is suppressing axon collaterals from cold medially located cortex panels in a non-serotomous manner. So now some of you might have picked up the fact that I was using CSNBC or bulbous cervical for the Roswata cortex panels, but referring to medial ones as the same media. So this is because we didn't want to mislead you. So we have discovered that there's another bulbous cervical projecting population interspersed within this media population. And some of you might know image and literature in primates that these are evolutionarily the older populations. So we renamed them, and importantly, all of these cortex spinals innovate cervical segment. And quite interestingly, this medially located above cervical cortex spinals in blue don't express lumicon. So then we wondered like which or maybe both of these two medial cortex spinals are regulated by lumicon. So using conditional genetic and viral tools, we can dissect these two populations, and I'm going to tell you some very interesting results we found. But to make the very long story short, we have discovered that Lumicon suppresses axon collaterals of both medial cortex spinals. And to save time, let me uh, show you here only the results this red for Akurama projecting cortex spinals leveled by CRIM1 CRI endocrine system. This intersectional gen genetic approach enables us to specifically label thoracolumbar lumbar projecting cortex spinals. So these are axial sections of cervical spinal cord, and compared to white type, there was a substantial increase in collateral density in the knockout, as shown in these images, and in quantification, which is throughout the cervical cord, indicating that lumicon non serotonin suppresses axon collaterals axon collateralization of thoracolumbar projecting cortex spinals. And finally, let me show you some interesting results about ALS. So this causes degeneration of low motor neurons and upper cortical spinal neurons. A previous study identified the same amino acid substitution only in ALS patient cohort, but not in control cohort. We mutated this conserved recent residue in mouse lumicon to see if this substitution changes any of lumicon function. 
when lemcon was over, overexpressed by cortical primary neurons in vitro, lemcon protein was very efficiently secreted into the medium. And quite interestingly, this secretion, uh, the, the amount of secreted lemcon mutant was decreased uh, compared to lemcon white type. So because lemcon is expressed only during the first two postnatal weeks of cortical spinal, corticospinals in mice. So we speculate that perhaps if corticospinal circuitry is made subtly abnormally during development, there might be later age degeneration. And to summarize the lumicon part, I first showed you anatomical and molecular heterogeneity of corticospinal neurons, and then showed you that lumicon is expressed by rosolateral valve cervicals and Lincoln non serotonin suppresses normal quantization of two cortical spinal subpopulations located medially, as shown in this working model. And importantly, this is a segmental level specific me mechanism, and Lincoln mediates axon axon interaction between cortical spinal subpopulations. And we also showed Lincoln's uh, potential relevance to ALS. And finally, this mechanism might give us an important insight into how the cortical spinal circuitry has evolved. And let me use the next two slides to elaborate a bit further in this direction. So to address the question, how motor cortex emerged and has your evolution, John Kaas and his colleagues have done very nice anatomical and physiological investigations across mammalian species. They found that distinct motor cortex emerged about 100 million years ago in early placenta mammals, and that the, through mammalian evolution, motor cortex has expanded grossly and ventrally by adding more motor areas. In mice, lumicon is expressed by evolutionary renewal of rosolateral cortex spinals, and in developing mammal uh, cortex, Lincoln expression by, by cortical spinals is nicely like, uh, conserved across species and it appears expanded ventrally, consistent with the notion that the lumicon is expressed by evolutionary renewal cortical spinals. And as you all know, a human brain is much bigger than a rat brain by about a thousand fold. But in contrast, human spinal cord shares most of the anatomical features with rat spinal cord, and its size has expanded by only 40 fold. So of course, we still need to know if the number of cortical spinals in a human brain has increased proportionally. But this imbalanced evolutionary expansion poses us a question, how newly added cortical spinals or any kind of neurons integrate into pre-existing circuit during evolution? So our findings suggest that lumicon and related molecules might play key roles in enabling evolutionary renewal neurons to innovate by actively suppressing evolutionary older counterpart. Okay, and using the last five minutes, I'll tell you about some very exciting uh, work in progress on the growth of biology of subcerebral projection neurons in collaboration with Hatch and Arne Engelman in the lab. On the left, you see a cortical projection neuron in culture having dendrites and a long axon. The tip of growing axons called growth cones play essential roles in guiding axon projection through sensing surrounding attractive and repulsive cues. So amazing jobs by growth cones are well exemplified in this nice movie by Kristen Holt. So guided by the growth cones, these two retinotectile axons project straight toward tectum, but once they come close to the tectum, these two axons diverge and then target distinct areas in the tectum. Now you see they're targeting tectum. And in textbooks, we see typical non-neuronal cells and neurons like this one, highlighting polarized and distinct morphology but really diversity and complexity of occurs in vivo. This is an, an in vivo neuron to scale and the growth cones are far, far away from its soma. 
So our lab developed, developed approaches to directly investigate growth goals of a defined circuit in vivo. Based on biochemical approach reported decades ago, our lab recently developed a novel experimental and analytical approaches to subcellularly map RNA and protein molecular machinery of subtypes specific growth goals in parallel to their parent cell bodies isolated directly in vivo. So basically, in our new approach, we label specific projection neuron subtype by a fluorescent protein, and then isolate fluorescent, uh, fluorescent growth cone particles by, uh, first, by using a fluorescent particle sorter and cell bodies by fax. So this approach yes, gives minutes. us comprehensive RNA. Thanks. <laughs> but this approach gives us comprehensive RNA and protein landscapes in both growth cones and cell bodies which enables us to elucidate molecular machinery in in vivo growth cones. And here we have two major motivations for this work. So first, we want to know the growth cone molecular machinery in subcerebral projection neurons, or SMPN, including cortical spinal and cortical brain stem projection neurons. So our, our subcellular mapping approach was developed using colossal projection neuron showing dark green on the right, but the growth of machinery in cortical figure projection neurons remains unknown. And secondly, we would, we would like to investigate how SCPN growth of molecular machinery changes in abnormally projecting CTR between knockout axons. And we anticipate that uh, knowing what kind of growth of molecular machinery is going wrong in abnormally projecting axons would give us ideas how to reactivate the growth of damaged cortical spinal axons for repair. So let me briefly explain about CTIP2 using this slide. So our lab previously identified that trans trans transcriptional regulator CTIP2 is expressed by cortical figures, including SCPN in layer 5, and that CTIP2 is critical for both axon growth and fasciculation. Uh, a growth and fasciculation for all cortical fugles, including cortical spinals and broader subcerebrals, as exemplified in those uh, lower panels. Importantly, CTIP2 is critical. Uh, CTIP2 uh, has become a central key regulator in cortical development because it's either activated or repressed or cross repressed by, key, uh, by other key regulators. And because of that, I've selected CTIP2 for this first investigation. So far, we have successfully isolated SCPN growth cones and cell bodies from both white type and CTIP2 conventional knockouts, as briefly explained here. So we use, uh, we use cortex specific CRI line to label all cortical projection neurons and then isolate SCPN growth cones from the brainstem and spinal cord, as you can see here. For isolating SCPN cell bodies, we inject retrograde tracer into the p core and then fax sort SCPN cell bodies the following day. So we are about to complete collecting samples for subsequent analysis. And I would like to share and discuss those exciting results hopefully soon, maybe in some later season of this series. And in the last slide, I would like to thank my colleagues in the lab especially my mentor, Jeff, for his like, very generous and insights, insightful support. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Yasu, that was a great talk. Um, if, if you don't mind, I will, I will start with asking you. <laughs> yes, please. Question. Yeah, so I might have missed it, but um, do you know that so Lumican is uh, supposedly deposited only at the cervical level in the spinal cord? That that seems to be your working hypothesis. So, so. yes, yeah, it's expressed by cortical spinals that project down to cervical, but right. uh, cortical, yes, yeah, it's cervical specific. So, do you actually see the protein being deposited selectively in that spinal cord segment? And the other question would be: Do you think it's being released from growth cones as these axons elaborate uh, branches there, or from the axon shafts, or what is your idea? So uh, my idea is uh, like at least we don't know. Like at the moment we don't know. 
But what I have uh, successfully done is to do Western blotting, taking out some tissue block from cervical segment, and I could detect the protein. And also when I overexpressed lumicon, I could like stain the protein in the cervical cord. So I think it's traffic down to the cervical segment, but I don't know how it's really released or exocytosed. Maybe it's activity dependent, maybe it's constitutive. That's uh, still an unknown like, point. Okay, we have uh, one question um, from Jonathan Singh Alvarado. And his question is, uh, the luminican results are really dramatic. Is the effect of luminican only visible at the level of axon collaterals or terminals? Uh, this is in relation to Alex's question as well. Uh, in the spinal cord, or can you see these influences even within the cortex uh, uh, or the descending pathways prior to the spinal cord? So in the knockout, we don't see any uh, difference in the, the extension of CST axons uh, in the knockout. I need to still uh, test that in the overexpression experiment. But so far, as far as I tested, there's no effect on CST like main the axon tract. Uh, but are there any central differences like within layer five of the cortex? Do you see any uh, changes in uh, the cell's morphology or uh, any other type of differences um, yeah. within the cortex? So within the cortex, I check like layer structures or like overall brain structures and like other types of projections. But I, so far I have never found any other phenotypes. What we, I have found, we have found is very specific to cortex spinal axon branching. Um, I have another question. Um, I was wondering, well, I have two questions actually. One is, um, does Lumicon have any cell autonomous roles or does it only act cell non-autonomously? And the other question is um, uh, whether there is something similar to Lumicon that works uh, on the other side, like the medial affecting the uh, BC corticospinal axons. Yeah, so to answer the second one first, so we don't know, but it's a possible, like it's interesting possibility. Uh, but what I can say is that, so Lumican is a member of like uh, 18 like uh, uh, gene family, and none of these like uh, family members are expressed in the other cortex span populations, but there might be some other, you know, like this, that's the, in the similar job. And to address your first question about cell autonomous functions, so first in the knockout, so when I checked the axon projection from the area expressing lumicon, I, I see some like modest reduction on, yeah, it's a modest reduction of axon quarters, which is not statistical, not, it, that's not significantly different, but it's modest reduction. And my interpretation is that it could be secondary effect by the increased axon quarters from the other population. So this is in line with my like, idea about evolution. So those new, like, evolutionally newer ones are like removing uh, like previously existing axon quarters so that they can have some space for making collections. So that's what uh, I have found so far. Very interesting. Um, maybe I can ask one last question before we proceed um, to our next talk. Um, and I was wondering if there are any common targets. Um, so I'm assuming that uh, these corticospinal neurons also send collaterals to other brain regions. Um, and I was wondering if any of the, the medial versus the, uh, the BC corticospinal neurons, if they target anything um, commonly. Um, so common target means like like bulbar cervical and trachlumbus. Right. Uh, so, it's yeah. Not within the spinal cord. I mean within the uh, within the brain. Oh, okay. So I, I so I think they both have some collaterals to some extent in the brainstem. So it's quite interesting to look into brainstem, but we have we haven't had time to to investigate brainstem. But that's interesting. Like.
Um, I think we just got one more question in the chat. Question in the chat. Oh. We don't have time for. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so there's one more question, um, and it's from Kader Oskan. Um, the question is, do you know whether thoracic or lumbar neurons have similar non-autonomous functions over cervical neurons to inhibit their overshooting to caudal areas? Uh, so I'm trying to uh, interpret the, the comment. The thoracic lumbar neurons uh, that, yeah, that's related to your question. And yeah, we, yeah, we, we, we don't know, it's possible, but yeah, it's interesting to look into. All right, well, let's thank Yasu for his amazing talk. Yeah. And, um, we, I think Alex will now introduce Oshri. Yes. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Oshri Abraham, um, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow with um, Valeria Cavalli at, uh, at Wash U, and uh, where she's studying axon regeneration. She trained uh, as a graduate student with uh, Avihu Klar at the Hebrew University um, in Jerusalem. And uh, where she studied mostly uh, mechanisms of axon guidance, but as I said, in Valeria's lab, uh, uh, she studies axon regeneration, and that, I think, is the topic of her presentation today as well. Correct. Um, so thank you, Alex. Um, can you hear my pre uh, see my presentation? Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, so in, in Valeria Cavalli's lab, uh, we're interested in molecular mechanisms of um, axonal regeneration. Um, after central nervous system injury and peripheral, uh, compared to peripheral um, nervous system injury. And um, my work in the lab really focused on non-neuronal cells and the contribution of the, the, the environment of the neurons um, to those mechanisms. And, and injury and regeneration um, uh, in the peripheral nervous system compared to central nervous system is very different. Uh, for example, if you injure your finger um, quite shortly after, you will fully recover. Uh, however, this is not, unfortunately, the result after uh, an injury to the brain or to the spinal cord. So this is mainly uh, a result of two uh, mechanisms or factors um, in the neuron. One is the, the activation of um, neuronal pro-intrinsic, um, uh, neuron intrinsic pro-regenerative -regener programs which show to be very uh, weak or even absent after a uh, central nervous system injury. However, uh, decades of research really uh, show the emphasis of uh, many me different mechanisms upregulating uh, after peripheral nervous uh, system injury in the neurons to activate um, efficient regeneration. So another factor that uh, most recently um, have more emphasis on with uh, many publications uh, in the central and peripheral uh, nervous system is the contribution uh, of non-neuronal cells that um, are in the neuronal environment and how they uh, inhibit regeneration in central nervous system and how they can promote uh, regeneration um, after a peripheral nervous system. Um, so the model to study differences between peripheral and central nervous system that we use in the lab uh, is a dorsal root ganglion. And the dorsal root ganglion is, um, have the sensory uh, cell somas, uh, the, the sensory neuron cell somas um, outside of the central nervous system. But what's remarkable in this model system is that uh, the same sensory neurons, um, they're pseudo unit polar and every neuron sends uh, one axon that actually uh, bifurcate into two branches. So every neuro, every sensory neuron send one branch to the peripherally to the periphery to the sciatic nerve, and one branch it, it sent to the central uh, nervous system uh, and enter the spinal cord to um, ascend to the brain um, and the dorsal column of the spinal cord. So the same cell when when you injure the periphery of its axon, it will pretty fast regenerate pretty efficiently. However, if you injure, injure the, the central branch or the, the spinal cord um, ascend axon, 
the regeneration will be uh, very limited. And um, a lot of it is due to the neuronal um, intrinsic response, as I mentioned. However, if you make a, a cross section in the DRG, you can see that the first larger cells in the DRGs are obviously the neurons. However, there's many other cell types uh, surrounding the neurons with subtle glial cells uh, completely surrounding here uh, the cell somas of the neurons, as well as Schwann cells that neonate the axons, vascul vasculature cells, and other cells that uh, support the tissue around the neurons. And actually, um, if we took a mouse that expressed nuclear GFP specifically in all sensory neurons in the DRG here with GFP, uh, uh, completely localized with islet one which is a marker for sensory neurons, and we dissociated and sorted those DRGs, and, and you can see that uh, neurons are only account about 12% of all cells in the DRG. So it's, it gave us motivation to really look at the all, what all the rest of the cells in the microenvironment of the neurons are doing um, after an injury. And this led us to mainly two questions, um, how the neural microenvironment really respond to peripheral compared to central injuries. And uh, we really wanted to understand how um, they contribute or inhibit regeneration in both scenarios. So to do that, we generated uh, a large data set. Um, we're doing a few types of injuries. So for the peripheral injury, uh, we crushed the sciatic nerve. Uh, and for a central injury, we, we actually performed two types of injuries. One is a crush of the dorsal uh, root. And another injury was um, uh, uh, dorsal hemi section um, of the ascending neurons at uh, around um, T9, T10 uh, of the spinal cord. Um, so in order to look at all cell types in the DRG at once in the same data set, uh, we decided to take the approach of doing single cell RNA-seq. Um, so we collected DRGs from animals that undergo all uh, different types of injuries. Uh, and actually, if anybody's interested, all this data set is publicly available um, in UCSC uh, Genome Browser data, Database. And uh, when we sequenced the cells, uh, we actually saw that there's a large group of satellite glial cells, Schwann cells, um, macrophages and endothelial cells, and uh, mesenchymal cells. And if we separate um, the cells by the type of injury they undergo, we see Big differences, mainly uh, after nerve crush. The clustering um, is really different than control mice, uh, which uh, suggests that their um, you know, gene expression is highly changed uh, after nerve crush compared to spinal cord injury. And if we count the genes that are changing in each one of the cell population, um, we see that um, there is higher uh, response to uh, peripheral crush compared to uh, a central injury. However, we see that every cell type, neuron uh, obviously respond differently. However, every other cell type um, in the DRG um, change their gene expression and respond uh, to the injury in many ways. So I'll just give you an example of few cell types that we looked at their response. And um, after that, I'll actually focus on, on the response of satellite glial cells um, to the different injuries and what we found about them. Um, so we were interesting to see that actually parasites in the endothelial cells that um, they're, they build the, the blood nerve barrier of the peripheral nervous system, that they really respond and change their gene expression after different injuries. Uh, for example, if, if we uh, label those mice, uh, mice with lectin that uh, labels vasculature, you can see that the DRG is highly vasculated. And this architecture of the, the blood nerve barrier is actually maintained by expression of different um, tight junction uh, proteins and uh, adherent junctions and gap junctions. And if there's disruption of this junction gene, uh, that could lead to pathologies and disruption of the barrier and uh, could affect neuronal uh, health. So we were looking at our data set at the different injury on um, those junction genes, and we actually saw many uh, changes, uh, changes uh, occurring um, in parasite and endothelial cells in the composition of those junction genes. And we're now investigating 
how those change might might affect the neuronal neuronal um, uh, regeneration capabilities. Another cell type that we were um, uh, looking at was macrophages. So macrophages are known to be uh, proliferating and um, contributing to uh, regeneration at the injury site in the sciatic nerve. However, um, nobody really looks at what's going on in the DRG um, next to the cell somas. And we see there is many, uh, the, the responses to the different injuries are quite different. And although we know that macrophages proliferate at the injury site, we also saw upregulation of proliferating, uh, proliferation uh, markers like K67, K67 and CDK1, uh, specifically after uh, cytokine nerve crush. And we stained uh, DRGs after the different injuries, and we saw really increase in uh, CD68 positive uh, macrophages after peripheral injuries and less after central injuries. And it, now uh, Ricky in the lab is investigating how, um, what's the role of macrophages and how this proliferation um, is affecting uh, regeneration capability of, of the axons. So now I really wanted to focus on the contribution of the satellite glial cells. So satellite glial cells are uh, glia in the periphery, unique to the periphery. They exist in all ganglion um, in the body. Um, and the, the satellite glial cells are actually cells that completely surround the neural cell stoma. Here you can see example in EM of three um, nuclei of glia, but their membrane is completely surrounding the, the, the cell stoma of the neuron. And in 3D reconstruction of an EM image, you can see multiple satellite glial cells within nuclei completely surrounding uh, the neuronal uh, cell soma. So we wanted to know, they're the, the closest cells to, to the neurons and we wanted to see if they have any role or how they can contribute um, to regeneration after injury. So in our um, single cell RNA-seq data, we actually saw that the satellite glial cells were, uh, was the largest cell population uh, in the DRG. And we characterized them by some known markers like adhering 19 and the potassium channel here 4.1. However, if comparing them to the other um, glia type in the peripheral nervous system, the Schwann cells, we see that they express Schwann cells that express different genes that are not expressing satellite glial cells like periaxin and NCMAP. However, some genes seem to be shared between the two types of glia, like MBP and PLP1. So actually comparing the top expressed genes in satellite glia and Schwann cells, we didn't find many genes in common. However, when we compare satellite glial cell uh, top expressed genes with astrocyte genes, we found much more in common uh, to astrocytes. And a uh, major limitation in the field to study satellite glial cells is actually the lack of um, markers or molecular tools to um, genetically manipulate those cells and study their biology. Um, so using this uh, data set, um, I was thinking of maybe I can find a marker or a mouse line that I could use to study them. And, and one marker that we found was fatty acid binding protein 7 or FABP7, also called BLBP, which is highly enriched in the satellite glial cell cluster. And by doing immunostochemistry of the DRG, you can see that uh, FABP7 is uh, expressed uh, in satellite glial cells around the neurons here, and it's not expressed in the nerve, um, it's not expressed in Schwann cells. So uh, having this marker, we, we could find that this mouse is actually exist. And by crossing this mouse, the BLPP inducible mouse, with uh, cytoplasmic or nuclear GFP, uh, you can clearly see that it's specifically labeled the satellite glial cells that around the neurons, and it was not expressed in the nerve um, in Schwann cells. So that data set also makes us think um, that satellite glial cells uh, represent a uniform cell population, uh, because we know that sensory neurons in the DRG are, are different from each other. Are the glial also different uh, from each other? Although FABP7 is marker that labels all satellite glial cells, by uh, reclustering um, only satellite glial cells, we found that actually they uh, can be divided to four different uh, subtypes. 
and we found some unique markers that express in each subtype uh, of the satellite glial cells. And one of them uh, was ALDH101, which is actually uh, a marker um, that labels all astrocytes. So we, uh, we use that mouse, the ALDH101 and G1, to look if um, satellite glial cells express ALDH101 in, in, in all uh, populations. And actually what we found that it support <coughs> our um, molecular analysis that uh, in the protein level, uh, it's expressed only in a subpopulation uh, in the DRG and not around all of them. And by labeling uh, some of the neurons with TREK A, which specific are only uh, a certain type of neurons, the nociceptor, uh, small di diameter nociceptors, we can see that the satellite glial cells can express around them or they can uh, be expressed around other type, types of, of neurons. <clears throat> Sorry. Which um, uh, suggests that they're not restricted to one type of neurons. They can, um, the subtypes uh, can express uh, around any type of neuron. So going back to see how the satellite glial cells change their transcriptional uh, response in the different injuries. Uh, we divided uh, by injury and you can appreciate that the satellite glial cells really seem to be dramatically changed their uh, clustering or uh, meaning their gene expression after uh, peripheral injury and less after a spinal cord injury or dorsal root crush. Dorsal root crush also changed but in, in a different <clears throat> way. So we said that they might be reprogrammed because um, they're really highly changing their um, molecular um, profile. And actually after um, peripheral injury, if you look at um, the clusters that, that emerge, one cluster, is new clusters, a completely new cluster is emerging only after a peripheral injury. <coughs> So now I wanted to see what type of genes or pathways are changing after a peripheral injury uh, inside of the glial cells. And we found a really high enrichment in pathways related to fatty acid metabolism, fatty acid biosynthesis, and PPAR signaling pathways. So PPAR are nuclear receptors that actually their ligands are fatty acids. Uh, and when they bind the, the free fatty acids, um, they activate a certain transcriptional uh, program. So the, the enzyme, the committed enzyme in the novel fatty acid synthesis is fatty acid synthase or FASN. And we wanted to see if it's indeed expressed in satellite glial cells and we saw high enrichment of its expression in, expression in satellite glial cells. And with immunostic chemistry, we also saw fatty acid synthase expressed in satellite glial cells around the neurons. So now we thought if um, expression of fatty acid and fatty acid synthesis is important in satellite glial cells after um, peripheral injury, what's going to happen if we now delete fatty acid synthase specifically in satellite glial cells? So we could do that by uh, the mouse that we, the mouse model that we found, <coughs> flocks to a, um, a, a cross to a flux. Fasen um, mouse that we were able to get from the lab of Clay Semenkovich. Uh, so you can see that there is no expression of fatty acid synthase um, in those uh, flocks mice. So those mice <clears throat> didn't seem to have any uh, defect um, in the morphology um, uh, of the neurons or, uh, or in their function, functional properties. So we wanted to test if we injure those uh, knockout mice uh, would regeneration be affected? And indeed, this is what we found. Um, so if we injure uh, the nerve and measure the extent of axonal regeneration um, three days after injury, while wild-type animals regenerate pretty efficiently, the, the knockout animals um, fail to uh, regenerate as efficiently as the wild-type mice. <clears throat> so looking at the downstream of fatty acid, um, Synthase, um, we found that the nuclear the, the sub, um, subtype of the nuclear receptor PPAR, uh, PPAR alpha, is uh, actually expressed in satellite glial cells here around the neurons. And uh, many of PPAR alpha target genes actually 
upregulates uh, in satellite glial cell specific uh, after injury, a phenomenon that we didn't see um, in the neurons. So the question was um, to follow up, would, um, if we activate PPR alpha uh, in the knockout mouse, would it improve their regeneration? Two minutes. And indeed, we, we did that. We, we fed um, um, the, the knockout and control animals with um, phenofribert, which is a PPR alpha agonist. And we found, although we didn't see um, um, uh, effect in the wild type animals, the knockout animals uh, regeneration was completely uh, rescued with phenofribert tre treatment. So then we went back to look at the, um, what's happened in satellite glial cells after um, sciatic nerve uh, crush compared to the central um, injuries. And if we saw a highly uh, enrichment in fatty acid synthesis and PPR alpha uh, after peripheral crush, we didn't see that effect at all after central injuries. And um, furthermore, uh, we saw reduction in PPR alpha signaling after spinal cord injury. So we really wanted to see whether um, application of the PPR alpha uh, agonist activation of the PPR alpha pathway um, would increase regeneration after central injuries. Uh, and we did, and indeed we saw that um, if we treat um, um, animals with uh, phenofribrid, the agonist, um, when usually after uh, central injuries, they're really um, slow regeneration uh, of the axons, with the treatments, axon seems to be uh, growing pretty well. So actually phenofibrit is an FDA uh, approved drug to treat high blood cholesterol and we wanted to check the feasibility of uh, repurposing uh, maybe this drug to treat um, humans um, with central uh, nervous system injuries. Um, so we, with our collaborators, we collected data from um, uh, mouse, rat, and human um, satellite glial cells and looked at the, the main pathway that um, the dif high differentially regulated nerve genes uh, express. And there we found um, highly enrichment of metabolic pathways in all species, as well as fatty acid metabolism and expression of PPR alpha signaling pathway, including uh, PPR alpha and its uh, target genes. So I'll just summarize uh, what I showed you today. Um, we found that each cell population in the DRG responds to central and, and peripheral injury in different ways. Um, every cell type had a unique response signature um, and satellite glial cells actually showed us opposite response um, between peripheral and central injury. And uh, by modulation of fatty acid synthesis uh, in satellite glial cells, uh, we could improve regeneration um, after uh, central nervous system injury. I just wanted to mention that um, our future plans with this data set is actually look at, uh, follow the pipeline that we did with satellite glial cells and look at other pathways and, and other populations uh, in the DRG, like the HEPA signaling pathway in Schwann cells, the oxytocin signaling pathway in the telial cells, and we're now in the lab working on depletion of macrophage and, uh, macrophages and, and seeing what's their role in the DRG. So with that, I want to thank um, my, my mentor, Valeria Cavalli, and the lab, especially Ricky and Eric, that helped with this project um, and our funding. And if somebody is interested, uh, we have a funded postdoc position in the lab. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. That was a, that was a great talk. Um, I'm, I'm going to take you. the privilege again to ask the first question. Um, but so co correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Presumably, the different types of injuries cause different types of gene expression changes in the DRG sensory neurons, and then all the other changes that you see right. in the DRG resident cells other than neurons are a secondary consequence of that. So what do you think is the signal that the neurons produce that changes the behavior of the satellite glia? Actually, um, we don't see a lot of changes in neurons after central injuries. Um, 
So I'm not sure what's following what. I mean, the signal comes from the axons, but um, it looks like the environment is much more sensitive to the central injury um, than the neuron. We're gathering now in the lab, um, it's a different project on, specifically on neurons, uh, but it seems that their response is really weak, specifically after spinal cord injury. But it's, a, it's an interesting um, question how what the signals from the neurons to the, the surrounding environment, yes. I have a follow-up on that, actually, very related to Alex's question. Uh, if there are no transcriptional changes in the neurons, is there a specific retrograde signal, perhaps, that is um, coming from the peripheral axons that is perhaps not coming in from the uh, central axons? back to the cell body that is then signaling to the uh, satellite glial cells um, that promotes this whole signaling cascade, uh, which allows for the regeneration. Um, so do you have any evidence of like what, if at all this retrograde signaling exists, what it could be? Yes, we haven't looked at that. Yeah, we know that a lot is going on uh, and it's really well characterized all the retrograde signaling that going from the injury site into a cell soma, uh, but we never tested after central injury uh, if that is different or not. And another, uh, I guess, related question to that is, because you showed that the satellite glial cells only encompass the cell body, right? So then why does it differentially affect the peripheral axonal uh, regeneration and not the um, central one? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so we think that the fatty acid synthesis in southern glial cells um, somehow contributes to the, to the cell somas, um, to the neurons to help recover the, maybe the axon's membrane. Uh, but this signal to activate this pathway is not uh, being activated after central injury. So the, the glia they doesn't know that they need to, to do that after a central injury. So by we hope what by using those drugs and you know artificially activate those pathways, uh, we might mimic the the expression and the recovery that happens in the periphery. Very cool. Uh, we have a question uh, from Felici. If I'm I hope I'm pronouncing it correct. Uh, is PPR alpha signaling, PPAR alpha signaling upregulated in a specific satellite glial cell population? Subtype. Yeah, it's a great question. I just recently looked at it. It looks like it's uh, in all subtypes of satellite glial cells. It's not unique to a certain cell type. We're not still, we're not still sure what's the contribution of each uh, one of the cell types, um, but they might be uh, other subtle differences um, between the subtypes. I noticed uh, in your uh, satellite glial subtype, different subtypes, one of them is the SCN7A that expresses SCN7A, which is a voltage gated uh, sodium channel. And I was wondering if there are any studies related to what this sodium channel is doing in those glial cells, if it if it's somehow receiving some type of signal from the neurons or uh, is it involved in completely a different uh, activation cascade on its own? Right, it's a great question. I think till now only potassium channel um, were characterized to um, express in satellite glial cells. But uh, we see actually in this certain uh, glial subtypes, I saw a lot of um, sodium channels um, expressing in it's really interesting to study um, how they, you know, respond to signals from the neurons uh, through these through this channels, but we haven't tested that yet. If I may ask another question, actually. Um, so there's this uh, well-characterized conditioning lesion paradigm, right, where a peripheral lesion um, before a central lesion will actually encourage CNS regeneration. Have you done the entire profiling that you've done in that in that kind of setup because there might be gene expression changes in the glia that explain also that type of conditioning lesion effect. Right, yeah. Um, I think we know that this type of effect, um, well, you usually do that ex vivo. You, you 
pre-injure the nerve and then you plate the cells and then you see response um but yeah it's a good it's a good uh idea that to to pre-injure the central uh, nervous system and and see if plating those um neurons maybe with addition of ptr alpha agonists and see if, if uh, you know regeneration would be increased in that uh, model. It's a good idea. I actually have another question, which is related to your the way you're performing the injuries. I'm I'm actually not very familiar with how these injuries are being performed, but <clears throat> excuse me, because you showed that there are also changes in endothelial cell and parasites. So when you're doing those injuries, are you also affecting the blood vessels? I'm assuming that the blood vessels are also being affected as a result of the injury procedure itself, right? And, and not just the nerves? Or is it is there a magical way of only causing nerve damage and not blood vessel damage? So, well, it's a crush. I mean, you don't cut them, you just crush them. Obviously, it will be uh, affected. But the injury actually is made, you know, distal from the from the DRG. Um, so it was surprising to us that, yeah, of course, I'm, I'm sure the whole uh, blood vasculature is changing in the injury site. However, distal from the injury site um, in the DRG, well, the cell somas are. We didn't expect to see those much of differences, uh, which we need to further investigate. Hmm. Very nice. Um, I don't think we have any further questions. Um, That's perfect. We're right on time. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for being here. Thank you to our special guests, Alex and Lena, and our speakers. Uh, this was great. Thank you. Uh, we'll see everybody next week. <laughs>